All right, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the event so far. Uh, can you show us by giving your applause how much you enjoy the conference? Woo! Woo! <laughs> Oops. All right. Um, I would like to emphasize one more time. It's just the two of us who are organizing this. So in case something fucks up, please forgive us. <laughs> All right. So next on stage is my co-organizer, Rado Stankov. He's also very famous in the JavaScript community. Uh, funnily, people associate him nowadays a lot with React, but actually he's stronger with backend and Ruby. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you can discuss all of these things later on with him. Um, one interesting, curious fact before I introduce him on stage is that actually in this very same building, in this very same hall, nine years ago in 2010 was his, actually his first presentation ever. It was at uh, OpenFest, uh, and the talk was about, I forgot about it. Event-driven architecture with JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine Radu, uh, ten, younger. Years, <laughs> 10 years younger. Uh, now he's much wiser and smarter. <laughs> Whiter. <laughs> Whiter, wiser, handsome, and so on. All right. Radu, the stage is yours. Big round of applause. Thank you. One, two, three. Is this working? Great. So yeah, uh, my name is Radoslav Stankov. And just one like uh, technical thing. I have noticed a lot of people during the talks are like taking their phones and like making photos and like. <laughs> and, I'm, and since like when I'm speaking, I'm changing slides quite fast. So what I usually do is I put all my slides on speaker deck. So the slides right now are on speaker deck. Just don't watch them because no spoilers, please. And this will be also my last slide, so if you like the presentation, the, all the, the code examples are in GitHub, and all like slides are on speaker deck. So yeah, so I work at a company called Produhunt, but today I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this thing, like dealing with forms with React. And before I start, uh, like, let's go with like a survey. Who is, the, the, who is the developer's worst enemy? Is the designer? <laughs> is it the QA person? Is it the sysadmin? Uh, is it the project owner? Or it's Santa Claus? Or it's forms? Like, it, for me it's like forms. Like, this is like uh, the thing which is like bane of our like existence and we are like constantly trying to handle them and they're very complicated and when something is complicated what I try to do is I want to stay calm and take a step back like uh, ordering food from Subway uh, and I like to always start with the basics just explain the basics because I think forms are one of these areas in React where I actually don't get much help like things got a bit better, but those are mostly from our side. There's nothing in Core React which helps as much with forms. So for the today example, I'm just going to use like a submit a talk uh, form. Like it's a simple form where a speaker would submit talk to a conference. Why I need to build that, you guess. Uh, so let's start. So this looks like a big scary form. So let's just clean it out, like this is the initial state of the form. Let's make it less scary. Let's actually make it even less scary. So let's start from the basics. So this is the way I actually develop stuff, is I just start, I want to need to have a form, get with like real basics. So how would we going to implement that? So I can imagine that submit the talk is just a form tag with an H1, with a label, wrapping the input, because I'm lazy to think about the IDs and just a good time submit. And how is this code going to look like when I need to show it? So the way this code looks like is I, right here I'm actually using the slate, uh, the use state for React hooks. So this is like the newest and most simpler way where how you can deal with forms. And if you notice like this is a very simple form. There is like Nothing much, it's not so scary. 
Uh, it was a bit more scarier like a couple of months ago where we didn't have hooks. Like with hooks, the situation is a lot easier. We just have this and this. Uh, but let's focus on this part here. Like if we just focus on this part, what's happening here? Like for people, always get confused. Like why do we need to do that? So in React, this is called controlled form. And the way this works is when the input changes, like when somebody starts typing on this input, there is like this on change uh, handler triggered, and it's, then it triggers set state. And then we render again with the new value. So when our users type, we are constantly rendering the form. And yeah, that's the basics of the form. If we look at our form here, uh, we would notice that every field here has like the same structure. Like uh, what I like to do in my applications, and I'm fighting with designers a lot with that, is forms should be guessable. Like if your form is very interesting, something is not uh, good because people don't like filling forms, and people like the feeling of consistency and knowledge. So every time I'm having like a form field, it has that same structure. I have something called a field. I have a label which explain what the form field you're filling out, and I have something like an input control. And this input control can be like text area, select, something more fun. And the nice thing of having this abstraction is, is that with over time, we can actually start adding more cool stuff here. And by cool, I mean helpful and useful to the user, increasing our conversion rates and making our applications more usable. And something like a lot of uh, things we would need here, for example, we can add a tooltip here where this actually explains what the field is. We can add an extra description with some examples. And unfortunately, not every person enters the forms correctly the first time, so we need to show some errors. And having like this as a standard way of displaying fields helps us a lot. So if we have this code, and let's simplify that to have our new system. So here we would have a form with a field, with an input type, and that kind of works. Like we have the field, we have the submit, and how this is going to look like in code. We are just going to extract this here into like a div with a proper label, and we are just going to pass a lot of variables. And if we pass all those variables, like, like we, we are passing titles like four times. Like, and the, the definition of duplication is basically if you need to change something in one place, does it need to be changed in another place? Like a lot of people think where we say duplication, duplication means if this code looks the same, that's duplication. And that leads to a lot of very complicated abstractions. Usually duplication is uh, a place where if you change one thing, then you, are, you should ask your question, if I change this value here, should I change some other, should I change something else in my system? And you should always think in your systems in terms of change. So in this case, for the field, I need to say, okay, I, if I can, can I just pass the title and just use that? And the way I'm going to do that, it's a bit more complicated. So the way I'm going to have it is I'm going to create a context, uh, like, uh, and with this context, I'm going to pass like my set state, and this is going how I'm going to drill down. So this is like the new hooks API for like dealing with state plus plus uh, the form context, which is a new API. This is like the something which uh, Mishu was talking about. Like you see here, like the hooks API and uh, container component look uh, uh, accepting like uh, passing like context are used in there together, like they are used together to improve their code, because that's how it makes sense. So how does the context work? So we have a form, it has some component, it has some child components, some child component, and then we have the field. The way context works is you have this thing, which is like a JavaScript object, which just is get passed to the other field. Like that's how the context works. And if we see that, like, the for, we, we now have like this form component, and when we scroll down, we actually see this field. And the field is a lot more simpler. We are basically just getting like the name here. We are using the context, like before we were using use state, now we just use context, like we are just replacing one word. And by replacing this one function call, we have this like a very generic field. So every time we just now we need a field, we just pass it as a name. So we have this field here. 
and it's cool, works. So I like to have symmetry in my code. Like having this, like it's okay, but I like this better because I can see that I have this package called form. Like a lot of times in the applications I work for, I'm trying to create like packages of components which works together. So you import one of those components and you use it in conjunction with the other ones. It just looks nice. Like you have a form component, you have form that failed, you have form that submit. And the way to do that is basically I'm moving the code from submit talk into like something more generic. Like I'm just creating these form components, I'm getting some children, uh, I'm just passing them by, I'm just re recycling my field into the other field. And my submit for now, it's just like that. But having an abstraction, when you build an abstraction on top of something, think about it as a box. Every time you have a new box, you start putting stuff in it. And, some, and in a lot of cases, that's useful to have more boxes to put more things in it. So let's go. We're like, we have a lot of things to cover. So the next field is an email field. And part of the HTML5, which is like an old news now, is having an email field, like an email type. And the way we want to address that is, again, we can use the name, but then we need to say to the field, okay, what kind of input control you actually need to render. And I would say, okay, I'll just pass something called control email. And here I, like, I, I, here I can actually start thinking, why should I name this control? Why should not I name it like type or input? And this is a, a little suspense. You will see that later in the talk, why I'm naming this field control explicitly. So here, I did just add the control property, and I just changed this one piece of code here, and my code works. Like, you see how like, I'm starting to build on this abstraction, step by step, step by step. OK, that was easy. Let's go something hard. Like, just having an input is easy, because it's just one property. But now I have like a text area. And the text area is just a separate tag. It's different than the form input. And like it's a multi-line input. I don't know why they make it like a separate tag. But I, I, like, I like my fields. So here I would say control text area. So here you see if I name my property type, it wouldn't make sense to have my control to be type text area. Because people would get very confused. Because when they go to Slack Overflow and like, and write like an input type, type text area and say this doesn't exist and the people will get confused. So we come here. The implementation, like this is our current implementation, like the new one is I'm just going to do something early here. Like I'm just going to have like a default control component defined in line here. Uh, and if the control is text area, I'm just going to get this is like a way to do like a delegation to another component. Like this pattern is very useful when you do, when you want to wrap a components. Like when you say, okay, in this text area, for example, if I want to add some other properties plus the property the user pass, I use this pattern. And of course, we won't leave the code in this way, but when you're developing, it's good for you to just have like a mess and clean up the mess. Because that's basically what we do all day make messes and clean them all for you. Uh, and okay, I have my next view here. It's the description. And now let's add something more fun, like a drop down. Like, with text area, it was kind of easy. When select, how is this going to work? Like, in this type, I would say my control is select, and I would pass like an option. So I'll create this structure which represents uh, options for a select. And the options would have like a value and a label. And think about it this on an abstract level. Like when somebody says you make a drop down, this has these values and we have these labels. And we have this, and the code here, we just add this piece here. <laughs> we add another if else. And we say if it's a select, we get the options, we move them from like the big ball of other props. And we say, okay, I'm moving to the options. I have this cool feature where if the label is not specified, I use the value. Uh, and this works nice, it's cool, it's great, but you start to see this repetition here, and my component starts to get more into one scroll of my laptop, and I cannot feel the feel on my slides. Like usually, I mean, I don't do this at work a lot, but if my code doesn't fit into a slide, it doesn't make like a good presentation. So 
this is like a good rule of thumb. Try to make like things a bit more smaller when they make sense. And in this case, it actually makes sense because what happens if I have like a hundred objects? Uh, so usually when you start looking at the, the form of the code, you should have the code has shapes. Like uh, Mishu said, it has like the tree shape or Riano roof from the <laughs> Street Fighter shape. And in this case, we have this shape where it's like something, like a default value, check something, check something, check something, check something. And this can be switched from something like select. We can say select, have like, uh, if this is value, this is value, this is value. If you write it into like more reasonable language like ReasonML, uh, we can have like a pattern matching, this can also work well. But another cool trick we can use in JavaScript is we can actually have an object where the keys is the property for the control. I would use this nice kind of identified. Like if you don't have something, it gets converted to a string, so you actually your default value for a control can be undefined, and you just pass it. And here you actually see a very good, um, like in a lot of other languages, and also in JavaScript you have maps, but they're not very useful for defining, like they don't look very good when you define them. But in this case you see, okay, this is all my control, this is how they look. In the future, I can actually move them to a separate places, so on and so forth. And my whole component now is just this one line. So this one, just one line, just makes and says, okay, what's my control type? Cool, that's great. Let's actually play with this feature. Like having this feature actually is nice. Let's get it for a right. Let's see the next property. Okay, we have the level. We have the level. And oh my god, this actually has multiple inputs. It's like with checkboxes. But if you think about it you know, on an abstract level, like having a level and the drop down is actually the same. The reason for for UX perspective is, for example, the, the drop downs can actually have infinite number of like options. You can actually have like filter, search, and that's good about it. And the list of check of radio buttons is for you to see all the options on, on a glance. And it works well with like Five options, you actually start to become like just clock scrolling to actually use like a drop down. But in our case, we already have our abstraction and we have like our option structure. We can actually use the option structure. And we can just add this control map, we can add something called radio group. And radio group is something that doesn't exist in HTML, but it's something we need. And it's like just a list with all the labels. Like I use the label trick. The label trick is that if you have an input inside of a label, if you click anything inside of the label, like on the text, it gets automatically selected. And we have this nice list of things. We are just reusing them. We are checking the option value, the value, the label. And it looks nice. Like adding this small feature just takes me like one slide. Come on, it's just one click of a button and it appears. So, the, the form so far is really cool, really great, and if, we, if, if those of us have forms, I wouldn't have this talk because it would be very boring. I mean, it can be boring without that, but still. So, usually what happens is that one of the key properties of a form is it has like custom controls. And that's where we go into like, I hate my life territory. The moment when we have nested inputs, like an input, like a list of things, like a place where I can have multiple speakers with their names, with their last names, with remove, and all of that. And if, if you start from this form, like this is our whole form, if you start from that, you as a developer, that's the first thing you see. Like you as a developer, this is the first thing you focus on, you start thinking, like, damn it. Can't they just have like a field when you can actually write JSON and deal with it, and I know I shouldn't like it? But having a simple system like that, like having a system we currently have with forms, adding this field is just, I can just add a control, which is like a custom React component. Because all my controls are just basically React components. They're self-contained, they just accept some uh, normal API. So here, this is my code, and here I can say, if the type of my control is a function, uh, and this actually works for classes as well, because the way JavaScript classes are still functions. So having this, I can actually put almost every input imaginable in my small system, like this very simple line. And this is like one of those patterns when you do it for the first time, it's like that. Oh my God, now I can extend infinitely because I don't just need to go to this hash, which now gets like 100 places. 
And for example, let's see how the form works. So I start typing stuff, like, oh, sorry. I start typing here. <laughs> OK, that, that didn't work. I forgot. <laughs> Like my, my goal initially was like start typing and then I start scratching and continue typing and the is my computer is so slow that it's actually rendering. So yeah, that's the form. And that's how it works. But as uh, we talked about on our previous talk, one of our previous talks about the, the registration system with, uh, for like the chat-like experience, everything is a state machine. Like everything we do is a state machine, and every form is actually a state machine. And it's actually a nested state machine, like each one of those inputs is a, its own state machine. But the form itself is a state machine. And, and usually, like most of the forms we deal with have those states. Like they have an input state, they have a loading state because we have to save. And while we save, yeah, it can be instantly, but a lot of time we have to go to a server or not a server, like something like serverless maybe, we uh, and we can just go here and from loading we go to like, either we can be successful, like the server can say, yeah, man, you did it, that's great, or it can say, yeah, order declined. And that's like the state machine, or like every form gets to like the state machine, and the way you think about it is when you click submit, you go to the server, it returns success or an error. Basically, you do a remote call and you can either return like a result that's okay or an error. And yeah, you can say like the errors are just like an object. And we start, like, let's go for it. Like, if I continue this road, you notice how I'm starting to build this uh, Eiffel tile of like features, abstractions, and like so far, what I have built, I have built like a very simple form interface. I have the extensible fields, like I can pretty much do whatever I want with them because I wrote the code and it actually, no, there, I don't have a project manager which can tell me what to do with those. And I also have like a standardized form layout. But right now I'm missing quite a bit of things. Like I'm missing validation, like client one, if, if you want to be like a nice user experience, server side, if you want to be secure, Protection against double submit. Like uh, we had this bug in the early days. It's like uh, it was slow, and people were, like clicking to submit two times when you don't have JavaScript and you have like two form submissions. Uh, also, it, like we have nested fields, but how was this, the the speaker input implemented? Like I didn't show you the code because it was very shared. And just explaining that code would take with all my time. Also, how we handle submit. The submit is just the button. Right? And usually, at this point, we go to libraries. And in React world, we have, we have quite a bit of libraries. Like I said, the React doesn't give you a lot of answers. That's more like a search thing. And usually, there's like a good choice, bad choice, stuff like that. And you have like, the problem is we don't have like three options. We actually sometimes have more, because usually it's like, I have those three options, don't like them, I'll create my own. And you get into that situation where you have two standards, and somebody wants to create a third standard, and then you have three standards, and somebody goes to the fourth, and so forth. So what I try to do is, okay, what are the two options that are, if you choose them, you won't make a wrong decision? Like, in, in the formulas, in React, with all those choices, I, like, for my own experience, there are like two good options. And if, if you choose any of those options, you won't make a mistake. Like, they all have trade backs, but I think the most, nice forms are forming and final form. And yeah, and now everybody would ask you which should I choose? It's like life or death battle. Form, final form, or forming. And the way you think about it, it's not like a uh, fight, but more like a nerd thinking who is better. Picard or, or Kirk. Like, you like them both, but you always, somebody has their favorite. Like, you can, that's the way I see those forms. Like, uh, I'm thinking I like this one and I like that one. And like, my heart is a bit more into that one. I prefer it. It's called Final Form. Like, some of its cool features, and that's one of the greatest features, zero dependencies. And that's great because like this Friday I spent like four hours updating dependencies and they're still updating. Yeah, they're still updating. Uh, there, it has something called opt-in subscriptions. Like the idea is, 
Uh, I don't know if you notice, but right now, every time I, I press my key, I'm re-rendering all my form. React, React is really good at like knowing how to update the DOM, but I'm still re-rendering. So it has like, uh, so uh, final form has these opt-out subscriptions, and it's only like 70 that 7 kilobytes when bind with uh, its React bindings. And also, final form is not React specific. Like it has its core uh, state machine engine, and it has its uh, uh, React binding. So how does it look like? It looks like this. Like it's really nice. This is our form right now. This is how it looks like really nice, like great. Let you see. Like, okay, I have to go. <laughs> so this doesn't pass my put it on a slide test. <laughs> like if I just use that library, it's great. But that's actually the reason I actually like this library. Like my forms all I want to look like this. Like this is nice. This is like something I can put on the slide in front of an audience and I'm feeling pink embarrassed about it and don't need to explain much. But I don't have a lot of implementation details. Like this thing here and this thing here, like from user perspective, they do the same, but on the background, uh, the form does a lot more. So the way I look at it, it's just I'm building blocks. So I'm just using the library as the backend, as, as the backend implementation of my form engine, and not like my form API. And the, and the nice thing about it is, it's, it's easy to change. Like if, for example, form make, make me angry, I can just, uh, if final form make me angry, I can replace it with form. Make. That's easy, that's simple. Just because I have my abstraction which guides me from the evil world of dependencies. So, okay, let's start implementing this with, Final form. Let's go first. Form component. For component, we just do this. Like we say, final form for. We get the initial values. We just have this weird form submit. So we are just having this thing. It's like a bit of wiring, but it works. Uh, let's go to the next step. We have our form field. It's a bit more complicated. Like we create our form field, which just delegates to final form field. It uses our custom controls, and we use this field row component, which is like our whole uh, list. Uh, like it's our label, it's our line, the way it looks. So the nice thing about this is we can actually add teaming support quite easy because field row just get like a standard set of properties. So you can actually add team support quite easy. I won't show it this to this today because I want to have another presentation. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to get too boring. Uh, yeah, this is how the fuel row looks like. We get the meta arrows and the submit arrow. That's really nice because now we actually have the error validation for free. Like, I already have it. I don't need to do it. And it's like an incremental buildup. And here, like the ID, like I'm quite, like having an ID, which is just the name of the field, can work if you don't have more than one form. So what I do is I use another React hook called use memo, which just call this thing once when ID and name have the same pair, and we just generate a unique ID which just maps our HTML form from our control. But see how this concern is so deep in our logic that we as developers we don't have to think about it. And I mean we are developers, we think a lot of, a lot about a lot of things. So every time we can reduce the, our cognitive load. It's, it's a win. Yeah, this is like a small React hook thing. So let's do the form submit. Like a lot of people are like, the first time I added in our code base this uh, form submit helper, uh, the engineer was, why are you just wrapping the button? That's why. And I'm like, because this looks like that. <laughs> like <laughs> the form actually should, uh, like one thing about final form is it has this really rich state machine, which is the form. Uh, like the guy who wrote the final form is the guy who did it with this form, but he made his his mistake that you shouldn't put the form state there. Uh, for every form, you should just do it for like global concern, very global concern. And having it here, you actually know, okay, if somebody clicks submit, he shouldn't be able to click submit again while the, 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 the form is submitted. You shouldn't do that. And here also we can have the states which are Form was succeeded, so we can actually show a message to the user. Yeah, that works. Right now we are saving. Here we can show an error. And the nice thing about it is, 
uh, from the form, we can actually make this a link at some point. So when somebody sees this is an arrow and clicks in it, we can actually focus on the first field, which is an arrow. I won't put it here because it's what we want slide. But this is like a good, nice user experience. You can just add it while you're waiting for your web pack to update your JavaScript files. And this is how it looks like. You have the submit, we have an arrow. It works, it's submitted, it's great. And the nice thing about this form spy, and this is like uh, they're building like a hook API, like this is an example where a hook API would be a lot better, uh, is it has all these states here. It has all this data about which field is modified, which field was clicked, which was changed, which was visited, and like a lot of useful stuff. Like I really like that because a lot of times I actually don't know what I need for my forms and it's useful to have that information. So again, this is our form, and I didn't show you how was this implemented before, because you can all imagine, if you just have to implement this, you have to have your own state machine, how do I state that, keeping a track of the field names, how do I remove that, how does it do it, and that's another benefit, the final form, it has plugins, and one of these plugins is called final form arrays. So this actually gives us an array support for nested fields. Uh, basically what I'm doing here is checking if my control has an array property and I'm using this field array which is like a special field just for arrays. It handles all my plumbing along the way of like keeping track of arrays, indexes, removable things and so on and so forth. Here I need to change my code a bit. If I'm not getting input now, I'm just getting fields and I'm using my fields and I'm passing this to my control. Like, with this small change, this will be my speaker input. So it's a React fragment, and, and we have, like, we are mapping to our fields. We, we, we just use the field name with the property of the object we care about. And when you click remove, we just say remove this field. Remove this, uh, add, like, add something to this field. And in our custom input, we have those properties because those are functions and are AK objects in JavaScript. So we can actually attach behavior on top of it. So we can say, yeah, that's an array feature. That's nice. And you see that here, we actually don't handle any state. We don't care about much of that stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a very key thing. Like, you can start building custom like setters on your controls. Like, have this small language here. And um, yeah. And, Okay, I should have talked about that before I put in that. Another cool thing, like at work we use GraphQL with Apollo. So every form goes to GraphQL and we have like a very standard way of dealing with every form. Every form input, every form input for is the same, every server response is the same. So we have a very nice way to map the errors. And with here, just adding support to that, like from a developer perspective, is just like changing the form to like our custom form mutation where we just say on submit like do whatever the server returned but this is the way we work with GraphQL and the implementation is a bit weird like we get like this Apple mutation we extract errors but you did this once like you're building an abstraction on top of your other abstractions so every time we're building a form we don't need to think about okay how is this going? What's the validation? What's returning? What's going on? That just maps to stuff. It's a bit heavy, but we can survive it. So yeah, that's basically the form. Uh, there is like uh, the, the code for this form is here, like the, the whole thing we're doing. And just the, the word of caution, it's not like protection really, like I just want to start thinking about because there is every application has their own needs. And the idea is having like a good abstraction makes sense, but you should tailor your abstractions for your application. And for example, another thing we try to do is uh, build facades on top of like dependencies so we can change the dependency later. Because if uh, we are using a lot of open source components and we are using the open source components, they change and they break. And we have, and it's good to build abstractions on top of it. So yeah, that's not production ready, so if you use it, like, be with cautious, like, I don't want to do this to you. Like, <laughs> push you in one direction, try to stay you, and then like this. So yeah, like, a quick recap, like, we have a basic form handling in React. 
like in the talk, we built like an extensible form, form field integrate, and we integrated it with like a battle tested form. And this was like a 30, 33 minutes and, 40 and 15 seconds talk. And we had some fun, hopefully, at least I had, like I did my, my walks here. Uh, but yeah, like we should think about our code and our stuff, like building blocks of a Lego. And this is not how you should do like an MVP. Like you shouldn't like do it like this. Like don't do this. Like when you build a car, don't start with one wheel, the other wheel. Just start with like a skateboard, scooter, bike, and that. Like when you build your abstraction thing, make them useful from line one, and don't just think like the ivory tower things. And yeah, that's all. Again, all the slides are here. Thank you very much. Uh, we would now have the same format, three panelists. Oh, we, have, we might have more. If so anybody wants yeah, to join us on the panel, it's well. open. You we have, have the like unique opportunity here. to be recorded for the netcast. Yeah. And then you can actually uh, ask the you to remove it. Anyone? Yeah, I will sit on your Ooh. Okay. Let's see. Okay, now we're almost off, right? I'm the So, uh, I want to say a few good words about Formic. Uh, we are using Formic. Yeah, it's amazing. Pretty great. Right? It's, it's, it's a good word. So. It's like the uh, card. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, let's go backwards. Let, let's start from the uh, from final form. Um, what was the warning curve and is it a vendor working library? I mean, if you're using it, can you switch to another library easily or it's... Like uh, the way I showed you, like uh, we are actually, in one application we're using something built our own, like a state machine built ourselves. On another application we're using form, okay? but we are having the same form interface. Like the whole goal of having this form abstraction is to guard us from the implementation detail. Like, if, for example, tomorrow I wake up on the other side of the bed and decide that, okay, maybe I should do forming, which is great, a library, I, how many slides do I need to change? How much work I have to change to make it work? It's not much. I just need to massage a bit of that data. Have you heard of JSON schema forms? Yeah, but the thing about it, the designers haven't. Like uh, the thing about this type of like form, it's a bit more declarative, but you can also use it the way you use React. You can actually handle it in a nice way. Like with the JSON schema, it's, you always look and in this thing I can always do some hacks. A bit more hacky. And build it like step by step. And I don't want the better one. At which point do you realize that you need help? Well, yeah. <laughs> what kind of help we are talking about here? Um, so um, I'm talking about the moment where you realize that handling forms on your own, maybe it's not really like, the best idea because you have a lot of code to maintain. And it's, yeah, to be, yeah, I like the moment I realized that was that actually I didn't realize that. Uh, this was realized by a team member when they tried to add something there. And they, for example, uh, like we had this situation once where we needed the, to know if a field was touched. Like if somebody has changed that field or this field was like a focus one. And we didn't have this in our form. We didn't think about it in our form. It was built very organically. Also like the core form we're still using in our application is still uh, uncontrolled inputs. And this makes a lot of like complex decisions. And that's when we, I realized, okay, maybe when I want something battle tested, somewhere I can have plugins and something a bit more standardized. Uh, have you heard about JSON schema forms? <laughs> yeah, like uh, two minutes, no, one minute and 17 seconds ago. I, I saw that you use hooks, so is that just for the slides or are you actually using that in production now? Yeah, yeah, I mean I'm using them for like a lot of like newish things and they're like they're really good at building abstractions like uh, for example the use memo thing I, I showed you I can actually build a uh, use unique ID 
and just pass, okay, this is the name, this is like the center and this is like the thing and I can build abstractions on top of it. So it's really good for building abstractions and the other things, building hooks, they're really good at for like grouping uh, stuff together. Like if we have to use a class and it has like this component has like your responsibilities, they get all meshed up with like uh, our component did mount has like two two function calls and you, you and your code starts to look like something called school yellow if you have to like uh, put it on different colors. Uh, but again, uh, hooks cannot solve every problem. Like for example, the context makes sense to be like that. I wouldn't use hooks to have my fields because they're rendering React components and they're accepting like React components. So it's a mix of all of those things. Like you, you want your code to be guessable, so the person who uses it guesses what the things work do, and be readable and concise and fast and reliable. Just <laughs> sorry. What you mean when you Um So you mentioned abstractions a couple of times. How do you find the balance? Because uh, I, I know that we programmers, we love to create abstractions. You, you create a builder, you create abstract builder, then you extract, then you extend the builder to something else, then you add a bunch of other stuff. And in general, building as abstractions is probably the most fun in programming because you feel this power of creating something, right? Uh, so how you find the, the balance where you, you basically have to stop with, with your abstraction and maybe search for another solution? You rely on your teammates to carry on the pull request. I cannot understand that. That's too complicated <laughs> and stuff like that. That's one of the things you can do. But but the the more serious thing when you think about abstraction, the abstraction solves a problem. And when you need to solve a problem, you have to think, okay, how can they solve the problem with the least amount of work? Because we are lazy. And how can this be changeable? Easy? Like if I have to go like five levels, like this happens a lot. Like we build abstraction, we build abstraction, then we realize that two of the abstraction levels don't make sense, then we collapse them. And that's like the constant balance. And that's part of like our lives. But it's uh, what we should like tap uh, is not that we should get ourselves for building like in my opinion too many abstractions, but we should be open to reversing them and seeing, okay, I have five levels of in direction here. Maybe I should like Collapse them a bit. How you validate this process? Uh, I mean, like, for example, in product hunt, when when you think that your PR is amazing and this abstraction is really awesome. And you open mind. Like, if it's an amazing comment for you, that doesn't make it amazing. Like, if something is useful, if other people find it useful, like for me, I might see this is nice. But if it's confusing and if people don't use it very well, or if I have not named it correctly. Like, that's how you just go with an open mind. Like, you have the joy of building the abstraction. It's also the joy of like, removing it and destroying it later. So, just have joy to time. Yeah, exactly. Just an attitude. Uh, so, here's the trick about the happy programmer you build an abstraction, really com complex one, and then you just destroy it. Yeah. So, I noticed your, uh, you use a pattern where you attach a component as a kind of like form dot. Yeah. Mutation. That's an interesting pattern. Have you noticed any drawbacks to this? Uh, yeah, cap, like uh, the way I call this is component as package pattern, like a namespace pattern. Like uh, as everything, it has its place. So this pattern works really well if you are using something like a library, like you're building your own library for the components which are used in a lot of places. The problem with these patterns arises that if you attach everything, too many components to a single like a namespace. Uh, that means you are loading all those components when you need them. So you have a problem with code splitting and reducing your bundle. Like for example, if I say my system has this user object and I create this namespace users and I can do users that cart, user that list, user that avatar, user that uh, blah, 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 and I have like 20 of those, those all get loaded in every single page. And I don't want that because they're not used. You want to use as much usable code as possible. That's the reason, for example, uh, the way we like handling like the form components. They're like four or five, and pretty much all the forms need the form. All the forms need uh, fields, 
And also, it's a really good pattern to have like a container with children style things. Like, let's say you have a grid component, and this grid component, you need the grid that container, which is like a container, and then you need a component that is a row or a column, so you just use those, because there you have like a parent-child relationship between those components. So, uh, kind of a leading question. Like, at the end, you talked that you use uh, GraphQL and Apollo, so is yeah. there going to be a half a day tomorrow? No, we actually decided not to do that. Like uh, originally, or, yeah, like uh, originally, the idea of the conference was to have like a half a day GraphQL, half a day tomorrow, but we didn't have the um, the physical bandwidth to actually finish the whole organization to it, and also it was too confusing to people. I was a bit scared that some people would not come today and think it's tomorrow, and a lot of people won't know it's tomorrow and come today. And then we have like this whole, and then we have to like talk with our partners, and we just told them about this day. And now if the, if we make the second day, and it's too much like work, and it's like again, it's a very simple to the way I do my talk. Like I build two abstractions, and I just remove one of those, and I have like a, something a bit more clear. Sorry for the question. Then. No, it's a good question. Um, yeah, let's thank Raul for the talk.